Hello, and thank you for attending Databases Beyond the Tutorial. Uh, my name is Eric, and uh, I've worked in a lot of different environments. Uh, I've worked in uh, startup.com around 2000. Uh, I've worked at MySQL uh, for about six years. Uh, I've worked in one of the top 10 e-commerce sites at uh, using databases at, at an amazing scale. Um, uh, I work with the MariaDB Foundation. I've had the opportunity to serve on the board of directors there for the last five years. Uh, currently, I'm employed at the Foundation for Public Code. Public Code is the combination of software policy, excuse me, software, free and open source software, and also public policy. Um, I do some open hardware design, and uh, I do other contributions here and there. So I'm going to imagine that uh, many of you uh, in chat or, or listening, uh, came to databases not because uh, you had a deep background in databases from education or similar, but that you are an application developer and in the process of building your service or your app, you had the experience of some sort of friction with the ORM or the persistence layer, and this caused you to need to know more about what it was doing or uh, have need to make it perform better. And this was certainly the case with me when I started uh, 20 years ago. So uh, I'm going to hopefully share with you some of the things I learned along the way and uh, the things that I was fortunate to start doing early and some of the things I wish I would have been shown how to do early on and I only learned more recently. Probably first and foremost is that I've worked in environments that have both a really uh, uh, strong emphasis on testing and creating faithful representations of live data in tests where uh, developers could uh, quickly and easily reproduce exact scenarios and those scenarios were a good reflection of things that happened in production. I've also worked in environments where that investment wasn't there and the costs of working in that environment were hidden but high. Things like developers not being able to develop with confidence, uh, developers not being able to share their test cases with people that could offer them help somewhere on the internet or upstream vendors. So, uh, so I would say that if you haven't spent the time and the effort to make your system more testable, that is something that I would strongly advise uh, uh, investing in now because the costs of getting to that place, the longer I've gone without it, have uh, mounted. So that's a, that's a technical debt which compounds quickly. And when you have data that faithfully represents your real data, that opens the doors to capacity testing in a way that is, uh, is very powerful. So you can create data sets and load scenarios that are representative of things that you haven't yet experienced. What will traffic look like three years from now? What will it look like on the biggest shopping day of the year? That kind of thing. And so um, just like when you do any performance profiling and testing uh, in the database, when you're looking at capacity and performance, always do it in a condition where you're measuring the performance before you do your optimization. And that way you can compare the impact of the changes that you've made. Uh, very often in the, in the uh, entry-level guides and the tutorials and such, uh, they have these very clear distinctions between this is a transaction or this is uh, this is reporting and my experience has been that it's seldom such a clear line that uh, most of the applications I've been in have been definitely a mix. And so I find the OLTP, the online transaction processing, versus the analytic processing, a bit of an artificial distinction. And what has been more useful for me is looking at uh, what are the usage patterns? Does this data grow based on the number of logged in users in the system or just the number of users that have accounts? Does it grow with the uh, uh, number of, of purchases being made, or page views, or clicks on a page. And so all of this kind of usage, you can see scales at different rates. And so thinking about what my data is being used for, the rate at which it grows, I think is 
uh, is is a much more uh, useful way to do that. And I recommend thinking in terms of uh, not only dividing the data that way in your head, but also on disk a bit. So uh, create separate schemas for things like financial data and more log-like data and user PII data. Uh, and then as a developer, when I'm, when I'm working on something, if I need to join data from two different schemas, already I have the sense that I am doing something that uh, maybe is expedient now, but I might have to change tomorrow as these systems grow at different rates. And on that note, if we're deploying to systems which are not necessarily the largest systems out there, especially if we're deploying on cloud-based systems, which tend to be uh, very expensive if they're if they're big systems, uh, then there's a there's a force, there's an encouragement for us to have multiple small data sources um, rather than than one large system. And one of the things that MariaDB and many other databases allows is that after we partition this data, we can then bring it back together using multi-source replication. So we can have one instance that's the, the big heavy instance for reporting, and we can have our operational instances be uh, the, the smaller, lighter uh, machines that are uh, cheaper and easier to replicate. So on the notion of, of moving your data into separate schemas, uh, I want to say a word about uh, development in general with regards to data change. And that's that I've worked in environments where it was very difficult to change tables, and I've worked in environments where developers had complete control over that. And uh, in the environments where the developers have really access to making table changes and uh, and and maybe uh, making new schemas. What we see is that the code is cleaner because the code is a reflection of the current thinking, not a combination of what we thought a year ago and what we've learned since then. Um, now, giving developers the uh, the keys to the to the database does come with some costs. It means that developers are now also responsible for all of the schema migrations and such. But I think that's become common practice in the last year, especially in the move towards merging operations and development anyway, the DevOps uh, trend. And one of the things that I've learned in that process is that it's important to work in such a way that it is easy for developers to make changes but also roll back. And there's a number of little things I've I've done along the ways and have been shown along the ways that make that whole process smoother. One of them is to roll out the code that's able to deal with the new schema and the old schema early and then at a later time like a day later, two days later, actually make the schema change. And that way if for some reason we need to do a rollback, then we've had the code that could deal with the new schema for a long time. So it's less likely that we will need to roll back code that doesn't understand the current schema. Uh, another thing that is uh, along those same lines is that uh, if all the code adjusting the schema is a tiny set of commits that are very focused, that makes these easier to cherry pick into code further backwards in time, which can be important if I need to do a very complicated long git bisect, then being able to pull those commits that understand the schema in this state will help me understand, okay, which commit broke this without needing to do a data migration between every section of that git bisect. Um, and so probably the key to this is to start doing it and to do it more and then as everybody on your team gets more comfortable with it, you can start making uh, more changes more frequently and it will become much more like the rest of the way you do development. Um, on those same lines, uh, especially in the cloud-based world where we don't have control necessarily of many elements, systems are failing all the time. And so the more we get uh, practiced at 
dealing with system failures, the less afraid we are of doing things like keeping our systems up to date. Uh, we don't have a fear that uh, there's a high risk if we're going to upgrade the database. So uh, if, if we get to the point where we are comfortable uh, uh, killing a database every hour or at least every day, then uh, then we know that our databases aren't going to be more than a few days behind uh, if we add that into our cycle. And one of the things about MariaDB that makes this uh, very nice, and this is also true of other databases, is that we have the ability to have a read-write instance that's our uh, that, that where we send all of the, the writes and the scale out of the read-only copies. But that also means that if we lose the read-write instance, we can promote one of these copies very quickly into that position. And, uh, and at this point, I'd like to point out uh, uh, Shlomi and other people's work on Orchestrator, which has a great user interface for this. And uh, it's not the only tool. There's other tools as well. But, uh, uh, but I strongly encourage taking a peek at that one. See if that'll work for you and your team. Um, one of the things I notice is that especially developers that are uh, uh, that have only used uh, the uh, ORMs or Active Record or whatever, um, very often uh, they seem intimidated to write SQL. And then other senior people will say things like, uh, they'll use that phrase, object relational impedance mismatch, which I I understand what it means, but I think that largely this is uh, a phrase used for them to sound smart and for you to sound ex feel excluded. Um, but I really want to encourage you to to not be uh, afraid to dig in there. I think there's probably um, half a dozen things that you need to uh, get to know when you start using SQL, and you will already have a lot of tools uh, to, to do most of what you want to do with the database. Um, you already have plenty of experience thinking in sets. This isn't new. Um, uh, you already, you've used a make file or you've used Ansible. So the notion of declaring what you want rather than procedurally exactly uh, describing how it gets done is something that you already have familiar with. And so this is what SQL uh, uh, brings to the table. And yes, it is more set oriented and, and allows you to uh, work in that way, but um, uh, but that's not very different than other things that you do today. So uh, I, I do encourage you to not be uh, intimidated by SQL, that it is just another language. It is a little bit different than some of the other languages that you've used, but it's also similar to the languages you already use. And so on that, let's, let's talk a little bit about this object impedance relational mismatch thing. Um, so uh, in, in most of the time when you have an ORM uh, and you're doing some application and, and we are just writing our, our application in the way that is uh, uh, sort of natural and, and most uh, idiomatic for the language that we're working in, we might do something like iterate over a list, make some changes to each object in that list, and for each object, save the, the update. Now, um, where there's a mismatch here is that we're really thinking in terms of an object uh, per object item. And so we are uh, telling the object relational mapper to make multiple single row updates to the database. And when we make an update to the database, that's not just a single write to disk, because the nature of databases is that it writes in one place quickly, and then it does the uh, rearrangement and the bookkeeping, and so that turns into several disk writes in the end. Um, now, we can, most ORMs provide an initial uh, uh, way to do this, which is just wrap that whole loop in a begin and an end, and then we're still sending instructions to do individual uh, row updates, but we are at least saying commit it in one write to, uh, to persistence there. So that's something that's pretty easy to do, and you can start doing that now, and that will probably eliminate a lot of uh, uh, your unexpected slowdowns here and there that you may be seeing. Um, 
But if you dig a little bit more into, into your ORM, you will see that there's probably a syntax for saying update this whole set of objects in this way. And that's where you start to see the, that's not the most natural way for an object-oriented uh, developer to think, but as we get more used to uh, uh, notions like for each where we don't iterate ourselves of the list but we tell the collection to do the iteration then uh, we we start to think more in terms of what is the transform I'm going to apply to this list of objects and here we're already starting to think more set like um, using our the the newer OO uh, uh, interfaces and so so these worlds really are coming together and uh, so the place to start often is just look to see what is our ORM generating and uh, set on the general query log in development. You probably don't want to do that in production. Um, run run through your scenarios, run through your tests, and look to see what it's doing. And you may see some pretty surprising things. You may see... Um, uh, you, you may see that it is uh, uh, issuing many useless rollbacks or something I've seen a lot, especially uh, with the uh, Hibernate and some of the uh, Java uh, ORMs is toggling auto commit. And then you can start to see, okay, in my condition, I know I don't need to do these extra operations. Maybe it would make sense to invest in eliminating those, tuning my persistence so that it doesn't do the sort of casual default use, which is safe for everything. Um, and I spoke a little bit about collection-based APIs. Uh, I'd, I'd be curious if anybody in chat uh, can point me to a really good uh, RESTful API that also has a good uh, bulk or set-based interface, because my experience is that these are few and far between, and I'm looking for a good modern example of one that I can model for other people. Um, but because developers, especially if we're interfacing with any other system, will expect an individual object-oriented API, uh, if we want to work in a more set-based fashion, we're still going to need to support that. Uh, but something that's obvious once somebody points it out is that you can write the set based one and then also make the object based one that simply takes the individual object wraps it in a set of size one and sends it on to the set based one and it is a lot easier to do it that way than start with the individual object API and then try to turn that one into a set based one so that's something you can start thinking about now. If you have areas where you're doing large updates and you're seeing that you're having to iterate over large sets and that's a point of slowdown for you, you can start to think about how to work in these list-based or collection-based or set-based APIs. And as you do that, I'm sure you will find that you are working towards having a data access layer that, uh, that you are you have your application, your business logic, and your UI logic, and you don't want that to all be directly tied to your persistence layer. That you want your persistence layer to uh, be behind an interface that allows you to do some uh, some tuning and make some choices there. About in this case, I want to use the AI, uh, excuse me, the 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 uh, ORM in a very direct and uh, and casual way. But in this other performance critical case, I want to hand write the SQL SQL that will make the change, make the fetch, do the update, whatever it is it needs to do. And a side effect of this is that uh, your developers will be able to move a lot more quickly because making changes is something they can do in a more localized fashion as long as they continue to honor the interface. So uh, so this is something that, that has uh, additional benefits as well. And I'm certain that uh, as you work towards this, that this will be a natural uh, outcome. And this is something I've experienced on nearly every project I've been on. And uh, just a couple of quick things. These are not uh, uh, these are not big deals, but they're things that have caused me um, more pain than than I would like. Uh, so I'll share them with you. They're not big deals. They're very easy, uh, but the costs of them have been high for me over the years. Um, uh, probably the the non obvious one is that even on small tables, uh, if there isn't a primary key, you will see 
updates behaving in what were to me surprising differences on the read-write instance and the read-only copies. And the reason for this was that uh, an update may affect only a single row on the primary instance where we're doing the uh, the write. But then when that travels down the replication stream on each read-only copy, it has to table scan to find out which exact row did it update. So um, if if we know something about InnoDB, we know that it actually has a primary key under the covers anyway. So let's just make that explicit, add it to each one, and not be caught off guard by this surprise. Um, another thing is that uh, uh, when you have very large writes, uh, they don't necessarily slow things down on the primary read-write instance, uh, but tends to be more serial in the uh, in the read-only copies, and so very large updates can sometimes create pauses or uh, or low parallelism uh, on the read-only copies, and so I divide large updates into chunks of a couple thousand rows or so, and, and that keeps my read-only copies running a lot more smoothly and a lot more predictably. Another thing is that always do your schema changes uh, with realistic data in test first, and if they are not uh, instant, uh, or close enough to instant that you really do not care if you have that kind of pause on your read-only copies, then uh, then use one of the tools uh, that that provides online schema change. And there's uh, Kona provides one. Uh, there's there's others, um, but. Uh, uh, get some practice with those, and you'll find that changes the way you work and frees up your developers to make much more radical changes to the schemas, to the table layout. Um, another dumb one is, is uh, enum that I have tripped over this one uh, multiple times where uh, it's free to add a new uh, value to the end of a list, but if I have to change something in the middle, then it does an entire table rebuild for me. Um, and so uh, just use integers, have an integer to string lookup table. That'll be a small table. It'll be cached in memory. The performance impact of that will be so close to zero, you won't even be able to measure it, or at least I've never been able to. And uh, and it's not that much difficult, uh, uh, more difficult for your data analysts to do that same join once you show them how to do it. Um, and and this is another uh, one that is is it seems so obvious, and that is that changing the time zone of your data is uh, is an expensive and irritating cost, and uh, and having to explain that no, we did not actually have a uh, a performance degradation over that day. That was daylight saving, so we have a have one fewer hours of data or one extra hour of data in that day uh, is. Uh, it's just time that we will never get back, and uh, and it is a lot e easier and better if all of our logs are in the same time zone, and that time zone being UTC. And then in our view, we can change the view of the data to be some other time zone, but let's keep the source data in UTC and, and keep our lives uh, a lot simpler. Anyway, uh, that's the end of our time here. I hope I have a little bit uh, of time left over that I can uh, answer some questions in the chat. Let's see.